Well, good day and welcome once again to the Genius Path. I'm Steve Bonnenberger. What an honor and joy and a privilege it is to yet again share with you someone who is out in the world that we live in. We live in the world of helping people. You know that we live in the world of our, our world is reinvention, redemption, reclamation, and then reinvention. We believe that life uh, stumbles for reasons and that when you stumble and tumble that that's going to be the forge, if you will, the crucible. That's going to forge up your genius and it's going to push you onto the path that you were always meant to be on. We're going to be talking with Jeff Hardy, and Jeff is a really, really interesting guy. He has an organization called Youth Ministry Maverick, and you might want to just jot that down in the back of your mind and be able to go there. You can find him on <clears throat> all the social media outlets, of course, which are YouTube and um, and LinkedIn. That's where he and I found each other. I find a lot of people on LinkedIn, and then he's got a great presence on Facebook and uh You'll want to know something about him, especially if you're involved in a church or looking for some support or looking for some leadership skills or maybe some material because he's a really good resource. Jeff, it's great to see you, young man. How are you? I'm doing well, Steve. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. Well, I'm thrilled for you to be here. I'm the old guy and I get to talk to young guys like you that are in the in the trench fighting. Jeff, let's talk a little bit first about you. It was a 90,000 foot overview. Who is Jeff Harding? How did he get here? What kind of work does he do? Let us know a little bit about you, sir. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, I'm a desert rat from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I moved here to the North Dallas area uh, in 2009 to go to Dallas Seminary. Uh, I grew up in a Christian home in a big church. Um, always had a lot of people investing in my life, whether it was mentors, friends, um, specifically in the context of youth ministry. And so uh, when I moved here, it was to pursue a master's at Dallas Seminary. And um, I basically entered youth ministry as a seventh grader, and I never left. Uh, wow. I've been working with students. Uh, my first of three internships uh, started the day I graduated high school. And so I really have been plugged in. There's a volunteer coordinator on staff, all ages, um, and uh, I love what I do. Youth Ministry Maverick is primarily a podcast. I'm actually working on a publication right now from a series that we just wrapped up on the Enneagram. Um, and uh, yeah, I love making connections uh, with people who are in ministry. Uh, I also work with the National Network of Youth Ministries. I am the area rep for the DFW Metroplex. Um, and so I aim to um, connect youth pastors to others in their area, uh, have longevity and soul care, uh, part of their routine. Uh, it would be great if, uh, the average tenure of a youth pastor at a church was more like a decade and less like a term in the house of Re representatives. Um, you know, that, that carousel that never stops. And so, uh, the next generation needs us to be consistent, needs us to be invested and plugged in and, um, you know, I feel like that is kind of a stereotypical, unfortunate reality of uh, people who do youth ministry, especially is that there's kind of a carousel that's nonstop. And so how can that uh, kind of fade away and how can we make sure people who are doing ministry aren't burning out? They have margin in their life. Um, they're getting uh, invested in by others as well. Um, you know, I'm uh, I. I used to think of myself as the young guy, but uh, now I kind of think of myself not so much as the young guy anymore. And uh, it's been a lot of fun to connect with other youth pastors here in the area. Um, and I've, I'm a lifelong investor in the next generation. Uh, I have long-term aspirations of maybe teaching at the seminary or Bible college level. Um, but higher education is Kind of shrinking and christian higher education is shrinking even faster so i'm also uh just trying to keep my my view and options open as far as what uh vocationally ministry might look like and different opportunities uh but the connections i've made on the podcast have been really great a lot of fun um a lot of very interesting people i've met um i've benefited greatly from them and i hope others have as well um and yeah, I am married to my beautiful wife, Faith. Our little boy, Deacon, will be two at the end of June. Um, 
and uh, my parents are still back in Phoenix along with my brother, sister-in-law, and our, our niece and nephews. Um, and all like a huge amount of my wife's family is here in DFW. So that's been really great, especially being a relatively new homeowner and a first time parent. Uh, that's been really good to have that support here. Um, but I've been at my current church now, Trinity Fellowship Church. Uh, this June will be nine years on staff. Um, just an amazing, uh, staff, amazing church, um, easily probably the most healthiest, uh, well-rounded staff I've ever been a part of, uh, fantastic leadership, amazing support. Um, and I do not take it for granted. And, um, yeah, that's pretty much me in, in a 90,000 foot snapshot. Well, I'm glad you gave it to us. That's Jeff Harding and he is the uh, youth minister, but his um, main focus here on, on our program is to talk about youthministrymaverick.com, youthministrymaverick.com. He's a resource person for those of you that are involved in churches and specifically uh, youth groups or youth pastors. Those kind of people are the folks that I think he serves. Uh, Jeff, you know, my thing is genius. I, I told you that. that and for me, genius is always born of chaos and it's always birthed out of fire. Things have to go wrong in life, I think, uh, in order for genius to show its face and then for us to be able to find the place that God has for us. That's my premise of how I do life. And I think it's pretty accurate after all the years I've been at this. So can you tell us what your genius is and how did you find it and where did things kind of mishap in your life? And how did you misstep and how'd you get to the place where that you finally started to get your mind around where you're supposed to be spending your time and how you're supposed to be dialing in your ministry and your life? How'd that, how'd that happen for you, man? Yeah. Well, that is not uh, a short answer. Um, I like, and, you, I, know, I, I, you know what I always say, Jeff, I say good questions mean you get good answers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I, yeah. I, t I typically, um, uh, when I send a discussion guide to my guests and then I ask them on the podcast, I usually give them questions sort of in that way. And many times they're like, wow, that's a good question. Um, and so, uh, I was joking with you before this, that, you know, if we're going to talk about my genius, it's going to be a really short conversation, but, um, <laughs> I really appreciate what you're trying to do with, that concept and the word. And I think when we hear words that are attributed to people who we consider superior um, yeah. and people who really are the cream of the crop and aspects that, you know, as, as people um, it's very easy for us. We are, we are our harshest critics um, and it's easy for us to kind of downplay uh, the significance that God has created us for and with um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate that question and just the thought of what it means for us to consider our own genius. Uh, for me, you are definitely right, because an another thing that is not only prominent, but promised in this life by Jesus is suffering. Uh, and for us to be able to encounter that, um, you know, kind of a, a, a fun uh, term that's always been th thrown around. And even you just now, you know, baptism by fire uh, and uh, hopping in and uh, I would say uh, throughout my uh, college years of helping out in ministry, as I mentioned, I did three uh, different internships, all at different churches. Uh, two of them were in Florida. Um, and uh, just being able to work with students and really uh, get my feet wet in the comprehensive uh, perspective of vocational ministry. And, you know, when I was in high school, uh, junior high or high school, when I walked into the youth office, I just, it was like the best place on earth. You know, I imagined being a youth pastor meant sitting around and getting to shirt, sh getting to shoot Nerf guns at each other and go to lunch with people and hang out and have fun and do crazy stuff at camp. Those are certainly part of it. Um, but, uh, I think what the rubber really hit, hit the road for me was my first job out of seminary, which is this job I'm in now. Um, so when I came here to Trinity, um, I was born in a huge church. I'd worked primarily with huge churches and, uh, Trinity is not that. Um, and, uh, you know, people in the, in the, it's kind of, people are sort of coming out of that phase now, I feel like in, in the country, especially, but we're still kind of in the era of the mega church. Um, and people tend to forget that the average church in America is 125 people. 
It's um, true, folks. And uh, yeah. And so when I came here, um, uh, it was definitely over that, but not much more over that. Um, and uh, the previous uh, youth pastor had been here for a long time, um, which is great. And I was hoping to kind of match that as well. Um, and uh, when I came in, um, you know, as I mentioned from the get go, I could tell during the entire interview process that the staff, the leadership, the elder board, all that really healthy, uh, really supportive, which was great. And uh, my first year here was rough. <laughs> I'll just sum it that, that way. Um, you know, um, and and that's usual for for a younger uh, I was, I was a young guy then, uh, a younger, newer guy who no one knows. And, um, you know, when you're a junior or senior and you've gone your whole, um, ministry life as a student through, and then this new guy comes in to wrap it up, that's not usually what you want. Um, and so, you know, that was made clear to me <laughs> by several of the students and, um, uh, you know, it was, it was definitely a lot of learning, um, and I'm amazed how God continues to use me when I'm humbled so often because I always think that I know what I'm doing. And, hmm. um, you know, uh, seminary was another kind of uh, crucible for me. I feel like I left seminary with 10,000 more questions than I had going in. Sure. Uh, and I really have come to value uh, the qualities of patience discernment discernment is so huge i feel like that and wisdom go hand in hand and i feel that they're huge because i feel like they are sorely lacking in our polarized extreme culture um of where convenience and uh strict polarized agreement are idols and it causes relationships and commitments to falter so much more mm. than they should uh, and so when I was going through that first year, uh, really getting involved with everything, getting my hands dirty. Um, and the longer I've been here and the more conversations and relationships I've made with other youth workers in the area as well. And I've just come to appreciate how needed, um, these sorts of positions are and these spots of influences, uh, are in the lives of teenagers. Um, you know, cause, uh, one of my really good friends put it, put it really well, Back when I was in college, you know, the church, as a church, we are called to replace ourselves. And so what do we want to see in people who are coming up to fill our shoes and our roles and how they're going to carry this legacy of faith forward, of loving others well, re representing Jesus, preaching the gospel, um, just really loving others more than themselves. Um, and so I feel like through a lot of that, uh, I've been kind of crafted and honed in the fire um, with discernment and wisdom and uh, humility. And humility never comes easy for anyone, even if they've already been humbled. Um, ask me how I know. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, having to wrestle uh, myself with, you know, certain issues of mental health and uh, needing a counselor and, um you know, uh, having to get past the fact that, um, that I feel like for the longest time in the history of the church has, there's been a stigma against mental health and that has, was considered a weakness or strictly like demonic presence. And, you know, the thought of brain chemistry and the thought of anything else, like how, you know, how, how come we can't attribute brain chemistry and other biological things that resulted from the fall in, in Genesis three, not just this overarching abstract presence of sin. Right. And so, uh, it's been, that's been really helpful for me, um, to explore those roots and, um, you know, for me just to be able to sit back. And as I love to tell my students to take the blinders off, we like to get so focused on what we're doing and if we do it well, and if something doesn't go right, then we're trying to look for something within those blinders. But if we just take them off, and see where God's at work here, 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 here around us. Um, and to know that he is using us can, and continues to use us well. Um, that really gives me and should give us so much relief. And that, you know, we can't make a student, we can't make anyone do something they don't want to. It can be modeled for them well. 
but you have to choose in the at the end of the day to be humble. You have to choose to be wisdom. You have to, to be wise. You have to choose patience. And we can't make someone do something. And when churches see uh, fluctuations in in attendance because um, the youth guy or the senior pastor dared to talk about racism um, or how we can help one another grow even when we don't agree with with each other on on certain things. Um, you know, it, it can be really disheartening, uh, but at the same time, it can be affirming to see when people really do connect on that level and they confirm that with you and you feel affirmed in that. And, you know, when Jesus said, you know, you we will have tribulation and uh, you will always have suffering to his disciples before he got arrested. Uh, we, we tend to forget that. And um, it's, it's good for us to be in a place where we need to be dependent on God because that's how we're designed. And in America and, you know, I need to be independent, pull myself up by my bootstraps when dependence is the goal, because it's how we were created to depend on one another in community. Um, I feel like in some ways it's better for us to be in a place where, you know, we're going through something kind of hard and it's good for us to realize I can't do this on my own, right? I need people who are around me, who are trusted, who love me, um, who want to see me succeed and, and do well. And for us ultimately to depend on uh, the spirit and uh, really just know that God is present and well, whatever we're going through, it's for our good and his glory. But the best thing for our good is dependence on him. We don't really get to define that good. And so, uh, yeah. you know, Jeff, I, I love listening to you and I can see the the value you have when it's, when it comes to the, the, the ministry you do and the work you do with kids. I mean, what I get from you and what I receive from you is just this groundedness. I received this guy that is, uh, you know, I can tell that you've been through some, some marshland. I can feel it from you, but I've been at this a long time and I'm happy that you pointed out that there's some mental health issues that all of us have to go through. And of course the genius path is all about, you know, mental health, emotional balance about finding your, your spot and then to be able to direct your life in a positive direction. We just have a couple of minutes left here. Jeff, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to think about especially those parents that are in the world whose kids are, um, look, I deal with misaligned and maladjusted kids all, all day. That's my, that's my day job. You know, that's what I do. And uh, lovingly, by the way, and gratefully, you know, I'm, I'm in the trench. I'm, as, I'm in as deep a trench with that as I've ever been in my life, Jeff. But I want you to spend the last couple of minutes and address your thoughts to parents. What in the world do you suggest that they do from today? You know, you have to almost create like a tabula rasa in my mind, you know, blank slate. Because there's so many issues and so many things bombarding their family and their mind and their ethic and their ethos and the way they do life and how they, how they used to be able to have a plumb. All those things are just under attack, if not being eviscerated. So... Just, just sum that up and give, give a message of hope to parents that are, we've got 2.5 teenagers in the house and trying to figure out how to get them to that place where that they're an established adult, you know, within the next several years. What do you say to them to close our time, sir? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I would say, the, uh, first of all, as far as goals and uh, plateaus, that you're trying to reach um, with your teenagers, with your kids. Uh, I think we place too much value on that college acceptance letter and those accolades and not enough on character building. Good for you. Does my child, does my teenager love people well? Does he respect people well? Is he thinking before he speaks? Is he listening? Uh, can he learn from his or her mistakes? Um, because it is far too easy to attribute worth and value and success based on, uh, now I'm not saying a diploma isn't important. I'm not saying that you shouldn't strive and persevere and work hard. But what I am saying is that for the long term, you're setting them up so much 
better and healthier and holistically well-rounded if you are championing how God has made them, um, the kind of young man or young woman that they are around others and for others more than, uh, well, if you don't get into this college or this school or don't achieve this or whatever, then you just aren't trying hard enough and blah, blah, blah. Right. Like, and part of that is that as parents, we want to feel affirmed that we've done a good job it's and, true. and we do a good job when what really matters is instilled and passed on, not so much what the culture dictates matters. And so that's the, the first thing I'd really implore parents to do. The second thing is um, find other people to invest in your students. Uh, a guy named Chap Clark uh, at Fuller University a long time ago did a study and several sociological studies have affirmed this since then that if your if your teenager especially has five or more people who hmm. are clearly investing in their life outside hmm. of their parents hmm. um, or even biological family, um, the biological benefits and the mental and emotional um, benefits that come out of that are huge. Hmm. And, and that is another huge um, thing I point to when it's like we were made for community. We were made to depend on one another because when you are in community and depending on a team, not just you as a single parent or two parents, you're helping your child flourish for the future. And so that's another big thing I would say. Uh, probably a final thing, a big umbrella thing has to do with technology and influence. Who is influencing your kids? What kind of habits are they developing? Um, you, you need to have all their passwords. You need to be able to have open dialogue with them about hard things, hard things, race, politics, sex, of course, right? And sex just can't be a one-time talk when they're 13. Sex needs to be an ongoing dialogue from when they're five or six to normalize everything. So when things do happen, they do have questions, they can come to you instead of thinking, oh, well, they had the awkward talk with me once or whenever I watch something that has a reference or we're talking about something, they're like, oh, I don't want to hear that, right? No, we need to normalize those things because our children, our teenagers are being over-sexualized, over over-stimulated, um, and a lot of that has to do with that mini computer walking around in their pockets. Um, and so it's good for us to be able to know who's influencing them so we can help speak truth in into their lives by helping others influence them who are rooted in the truth, rooted in the gospel, rooted in really affirming the good qualities and characteristics of who God has called them to be. His name is Jeff Harding. He is the uh, founder of... Uh, youthministrymaverick.com. Go there, find him, uh, study his material. If you're involved in a church organization or have young teenagers, you need, you need to know this gentleman. And uh, boy, I'm just really glad you've been here, Jeff. And I look forward to getting to know you better. And uh, folks, I remind you, this is the genius path. And if you want to find out about who we are and what we do and how we're involved in the whole cutting uh, edge uh, technology, of how to re rewire a, a mind and redirect a life. Go to thegeniuspath.com, thegeniuspath.com. Until next time, I remind you that I'm Steve Bonnenberger, and this is The Genius Path. Travel far.